Okay, welcome back. We have got our panel together and we are going to begin our next panel at this time. I will go ahead and turn the program over to Nestor Ramirez to start our conversation about inspiring leadership. Thank you, Nestor. All right, thank you, Sean. Um, uh, again, my name is Nestor Ramirez. Uh, for those of you that may not know me, I'm a technology center uh, group director here at the USPTO. Uh, in, in TC2400, we handle uh, technologies related to uh, networking, multiplexing, cybersecurity, um, and, um, and, uh, and video compression. Uh, so, uh, so again, we are here uh, with Alejandra Castillo. She was sworn in as U.S. Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Economic Development on August 13, 2021. She has served on the leadership positions for three presidents. Uh, her professional career spans two decades, focusing on uh, creating equitable and inclusive opportunities for all Americans. Uh, so let me take this opportunity to welcome Assistant Secretary Castillo to our program. Uh, we're very excited to have you. Thank you so much, Nestor. I'm very excited to be here. And this is not my first time, um, not, not only working and collaborating with the USPTO, but I'm delighted to be part of this program today. Excellent. Uh, so our audience may not be familiar with the U.S. Economic Development Administration. Uh, so, um, so what is the mission of this agency and what is your role within the EDA? Sure. So let me take a moment of privilege just to um, not only thank you, but thank uh, uh, the rest of the, of, the, of the team. I'm honored to be here. Um, Hispanic innovation and entrepreneurship is critical to our economic recovery, but let me take a step back. For many, many of your audience, we know commerce as a this big uh, department of, of which USPTO is one of them. And uh, we're a family of almost 12 different agencies, and I'm sure it's been discussed mm -hmm. before, but for the purposes of context, you know, the Census Bureau, which is critical. We just finished our 2020 census, of which um, Hispanics, Latinos are continuing to be among the fastest growing uh, population in the country. We also have obviously NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, which there's incredible uh, work being done there. The International Trade Administration, the Minority Business Development Agency, which I had the good fortune of leading during the Obama years. Um, and we have, you know, again, we have uh, just incredible wealth of knowledge and of engagement. So for EDA, the Economic Development Administration, at this particular moment in time, as we weather and we try to get through this pandemic and we try also look at the economic landscape with writ large, the type of innovations and entrepreneurial opportunities that are coming down the pike, EDA plays an, an important role. We not only work with communities, we work with organizations, we work with um, various leaders across the country to really look at how do we devise economic development strategies that are not coming from Washington, but that are truly being designed and th thought, of, thought of from the community up. At EDA, we are now in a, in a very unique moment um, under the American Rescue Plan. EDA has $3 billion of grant opportunities. Among them, it's uh, the, the largest one is the Build Back Better. Uh, challenge, which as you've heard President Biden speak over and over, this is our moment to really uh, drive our country not only to recover, but to build back in a, in, a, in a more resilient manner. So the Build Back Better Challenge is very unique because it's a, it's a call to, um, to communities and to regions. We talk about regional economic development and to regions to look at what are the industries, what are the opportunities to really jumpstart economic uh, growth across regions. We also work a lot uh, in the area of workforce development, uh, looking at tech and innovation and how they apply and hopefully unleash entrepreneurship uh, opportunities, which the USPTO is, is critical in that endeavor. So EDA used to be a small agency, but right now it's being looked at as a primary uh, bureau within the Department of Commerce to really help jumpstart um, economic opportunity, economic growth, economic resiliency um, in so many different communities across the country. It is, it is always interesting to, um, to see that, um, you know, to get a little more detail on, on the, the important work that goes on behind the scenes on all these bureaus and agencies, particularly within commerce. 
uh, it's always an, an amazing sort of uh, uh, perspective. Uh, so I, 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 now I'd like to go way back and 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 take you know take a, a closer look at how you got to where you are today, because uh, your interest your your story is very interesting. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask you about um, you know how you got to where you are today. Uh, your parents were immigrants from the Dominican Republic, uh, and you grew up in in New York City. Uh, so tell us a little bit about your experience as a child of immigrant. Um, uh, growing up in, in New York City. Yeah, so, so um, Nestor, I'm sure this story ripples across our communities, right? We have parents who come to different parts of the country, whether it's New York City or Miami, Florida or Los Angeles, parents who come with a, a, a big dream. And that dream in so many ways, um, at least in my family, was anchored on entrepreneurship. Uh, my father was a, what's called a bodeguero, a grocery store owner in the Bronx in the 1970s. And I, I mentioned that because in the 70s, New York City was going through perhaps one of the most challenging moments in its own economic um, landscape. And I watched and I witnessed um, how the Bronx in particular was very divested. There wasn't money coming into the community. Uh, housing was dilapidated. A lot of um, lack of of that economic vitality, in large part because not only the city, but the state and even the federal government had turned the other way. So I mentioned that because I grew up understanding the importance of not only uh, government, but government service, and being able to be advocates for our communities in so many ways. Um, New York took me, uh, I became an immigrant uh, during my, when I was 11, because my parents decided to go back to the Dominican Republic or what they claimed was home, only to recognize that home was really the U.S. So I, I, I have the immigrant experience in reverse, and it's never easy, but it does give you perspective. And I grew up with perspective of not just my community, but also communities across the, the, you know, the, the world. Um, I lived a, a, a little bit in Portugal, and at that time, it was also coming, coming into the EU. All of this was shaping not only my curiosity, which is a, at times a bit insatiable. I am a very curious person, but more importantly, my direction. And my direction was that I, I needed to understand not only the formal economy, but at times even the informal economies, which you, you can appreciate. And in cities, it's, it's, it gives them vibrancy. But in that journey, coming to DC, I came to DC, I worked for Senator Kennedy, uh, and really looking at the power of legislation, the power of policy, what I call the setting of the rules of engagement. Um, and I realized that many times we are not at the table when those rules of engagement are being form formulated. I, I say that because the journey also took me uh, into the Clinton White House, I worked for President Obama here at Commerce. And at this moment in time, I really wanted to come back to Commerce because Commerce, as we said, so many different agencies, and they all have a very important role to play. But more importantly, and you'll you'll understand this because you, you are also working at cutting edge issues of cybersecurity and cryptocurrency and all of that. How do we today as Latinos sit at the table to be part of how the rules of engagement of the future economy is going to play out. We need to not only have these conversations, but really be fully engaged. The deluge of technology and innovation that is coming down the pipe, the ability to grow businesses, to protect our intellectual property when we create new, new approaches and new, and new technologies is something that not only we must do, but actually, it's not unfamiliar. We have lots of great Latino innovators and, and um, inventors. But what we need to make sure is that they understand what are the levers that they must access in order to protect their intellectual property, in order to commercialize their, their inventions, as well as to be the transformative agents of what our future economy is going to be. So my journey has meandered. It's been a wonderful journey. But it's all, always been anchored around how do we as a community also grow our wealth and our and and really raise our voices in terms of being the trans transformative agents 
that we can be to make, to make our country stronger, more resilient, as well as more prosperous in a more equitable way. Oh, we can't hear you, National Wire. I can't hear you. <laughs> well, sorry about that. I, you just touched on a couple items that I um, that I further want to uh, expand with you. Uh, one of which is is this transition going from you know you're, you're growing up in New York City uh, and then you you move to the Dominican Republic uh, and and all of a sudden you find yourself you know being the immigrant uh, you know going back to to the home country of your parents. Uh, I, I grew up in Puerto Rico. Uh, I, uh, I moved to the mainland to go to school, uh, and I've been here for like 37 years, right? So when I go back to Puerto Rico, you know, yeah, it's great to visit, but I'm, I'm sort of the outsider nowadays, right? And, um, and it is, you know, it is an interesting sort of dynamic that, uh, that goes on uh, when you go back and forth. Uh, what aspects of, of U.S. life did you miss, you know, as a kid, you know, going back to the Dominican Republic and, and, uh, and, 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 and experiencing that? And, 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 and another thing is, is that I, I read that you went back right after uh, a hurricane had hit, you know, the, the Dominican Republic, which again exposed you to a whole different aspect of things that, that sometimes, you know, uh, uh, people in the mainland don't experience. Yeah, and, and those are all great questions. So, you know, I, I failed to mention NOAA as one of our sister agencies here at Commerce, right? And how climate, especially as we talk about it today, we, we're seeing more hurricanes uh, forming faster with greater intensity. And you mentioned uh, as a child, I witnessed a category five hurricane, uh, Hurricane David, people may not remember. And coming from New York, I was kind of, I was sent to DR and, and all I could see was these palm trees, they were all tilted. And the, 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 it looked like I was in a, in a world, a different world onto itself, a, a world where I even questioned like, what did I do to deserve this? Like, a, was it a punishment? But it was indicative of as a child, what you see through your eyes after a hurricane, your entire environment has been unsettled. And that was very um, formative for me because for those individuals who have never had to witness an earthquake, a hurricane, uh, droughts, we take climate for granted. And right now, I think climate change is knocking on our doors and telling us mm -hmm. we're here. So the question really is, um, again, you and I go back and forth. We, we hear our family members who don't have energy, who are, are really struggling in terms of infrastructure all around. And by the way, Nestor, I love Puerto Rico. You know, we're, we're talking about a, 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 a such a special place where hurricanes, earthquakes, the electric grid is, is all being challenged. So our jobs, as we are here in, in what we call the mainland, is to really figure out how is our role as, as government um, representatives um, serving, whether it's the administration or Congress, what do we do to make sure that policies, le legislation, policy programs, and budgets, because we've got to follow the money, and budgets are allocated in a way that one is equitable and two transformative. It's no longer a linear process. We have to like jumpstart change. So all of the, all of my um, lived experience has been to put me in this moment in time and really leverage all of that experience, that background, my contacts, to make sure that EDA is stronger, but it's also responsive. That we're not just responding when there's a disaster, but that we're actually planting the seeds that are going to build that arc of the future. Um, so it's exciting times, and it's going to require all of us to be in this game. Yeah, and I, it, it's interesting that I uh, I did not know that EDA has a role in in disaster recovery. Uh, I anytime I think of that, I think of FEMA. That's what you hear on the news. Uh, you don't hear of anything else. Uh, and uh, and and I was surprised to hear you know the the role that EDA has, uh, which is which is particularly interesting because it, it's concentrated on that aftermath. Uh, which has been my my own personal experience. The aftermath of the hurricane is always worse than the storm itself, uh, and uh, and 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 your agency has a, a a substantial role in 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 coming into these communities and 
and and figuring out what they need to do to you know get themselves back up you know after the storm uh could you could you expand on that a little bit sure sure so you're right um we all hear about fema and it's a critical agency but once fema goes in <clears throat> and assesses the damage they activate people uh agencies like eda and and one thing that you are absolutely right when the cameras have all left who's left in communities to help rebuild mm -hmm. and i will submit to you it's 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 agencies like eda we're there for the long haul as a matter of fact just two weeks ago we 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 announced a, another grant to um, puerto rico of 16.3 million dollars to do exactly continue to build on resiliency in total in the last um in the last uh, four years we provided Puerto Rico as an example, obviously, because it's near and dear to our heart, of $90 million. And these are type of grants that are, that are one, uh, to help in terms of public works, two, to help in terms of, of um, resiliency, and three, to help in terms of entrepreneurship. So EDA also has a revolving loan fund that has been used for small businesses to help them in that process. So you're absolutely right. When the cameras are gone, who's left? And it's uh, bureaus like EDA that are continuing to do the work day in and day out. Um, it's exciting, it's it's hard work because we're seeing the succession of, of these disasters happening so fast, but we are in communities in Louisiana, in Puerto Rico, uh, in areas where, you know, uh, uh, in areas across the country where um, disasters are really unsettling the entire ecosystem. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit here, uh, and I'm going to ask you about this other story that I read about, uh, which is the EDA's involvement in, in, the, um, in the field of dreams, uh, the iconic site uh, of the, uh, in Iowa where the famous movie was filmed. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, again, um, we make investments across the country and we call them investments because we are that initial capital that comes in um, when no other uh, can or, or wants to. But again, we also require a matching fund, which is the way of making sure that communities have a stake in this. Um, and when it comes to projects, not only uh, water, water, water lines, water treatment, sewage, uh, brick and mortar. But we also do a lot of work in, um, for example, in travel and tourism, looking at how do we build the ecosystem so that communities can have um, more visitors, more at stake. And, and if I may, um, just to bring it a bit more at the macro level, under the American Rescue Plan, we had $750 million that went to the travel, tourism, and outdoors um, uh, industry because we all know how hard how hard they were hit during the pandemic. So the, the Field of Dream uh, effort is one of many things that we do in that space. But again, it's with an eye on what is the economic multiplier effect that our investments as, as custodians of taxpayer dollars can generate in every one of those investments. So that is one because so many people know of it and so many people uh, go to it. And as somebody of Dominican descent, you know how baseball is of, of our great passion. So it is it is um, one of many examples of how we make critical investments in communities to help spur uh, economic resiliency and economic development. Yeah, and it, it's again, it's, it's the great work of, of government in in, uh, in helping a particular community and, and, and helping them in a way that's going to generate future economic growth. And uh, Nestor, if I, if I can piggyback on that, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, I believe in government. I, I've seen when governments do not work growing up in Latin America, and I've seen how government can be an engine, an engine of change and, and, and growth. So for us, it's really a, t a showcasing to taxpayers, to people across the country, that that water plant that no one sees, but everyone uses, has to need um, not only maintenance, but it needs to be uh, built at times. And that's what EDA does. That's what government can do. And sometimes we're invisible, right? No one understands 
that a, a particular project or effort was done by EDA. But that's that's the that's the beauty of our job. We don't need to be fully seen. We just need to be understood that if not for certain investments, the infrastructure starts to decay. The water is not as high of a quality. So that's where EDA really plays its best. So, um, so I want to share with the audience, uh, uh, you know, a little summary of your resume because I think it's, you know, it's particularly uh, impressive. Uh, in terms of education, you hold a bachelor's degree in economics and political science. You have a master's degree in public affairs and, and a Juris Doctor's degree. Uh, you worked in the National Drug Control Policy of, of the White House. Uh, you uh, served as executive director in the National uh, the Hispanic National Bar Association. Uh, you also worked at the International Trade Administration, the Minority Business Development Agency, and you were the chief executive officer of the YMCA. Uh, again, impressive, uh, a, a whole myriad of experiences uh, that are really, uh, uh, you know, geared towards helping communities and, and particularly on other developed communities in, in the U.S. Uh, so, um, so I, you know, I, I think we all acknowledge that there is there is still so much work to be done across the nation uh, in these areas, some more than others. Um, but within the context of your life experience uh, and extensive background in this area, what is government doing right? What is uh, what can be improved? Uh, and how can we make a difference and perhaps turn the corner on some of these issues? Sure. So I, I think government is doing lots of things right, right? Um, when we look at the whole uh, family of agencies at Commerce, again, going back to USPTO, that is truly a hallmark of the United States. The fact that, and it's even in our constitutions, as you all know, how do we protect inventors? How do we protect intellectual property to really help spur economic opportunity? That, that work is critical and paramount, especially as we're moving more and more into a technology and innovation era. So that we're doing right. Is there room for growth? Absolutely. What is government doing right? I think this debate on the infrastructure bill is paramount as well. When we travel around the world, we're seeing countries that have an infrastructure that really blows us away in terms of efficiencies and expediency. Whether you go to Europe and you look at their rail system, whether you go to uh, Singapore and look at all, all the uh, ports and, 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 and infrastructure as well. So we need to do more of that in order to be competitive in a 21st century economy and world altogether. Um, what is government doing right? It's doing right, I think, under the Biden administration. We're asking for communities to be the, the to tell us, what do you need? Not for government, not for Washington to be the ones dictating what they need. So there's a lot that government is doing right. What can government do better? We can level the playing field. We can start to address inequalities. And I'm not just talking uh, in terms of racial inequalities, well, I'm also speaking on geographical inequalities, rural versus urban uh, equality in terms of uh, what women need to go back into the to the workplace given this pandemic. So government really can again, to as we spoke before, start to level the playing field, and more importantly, the rules of engagement that are going to dictate the next economic reality. We need to be at the table. We need to make sure that those rules of engagements are being drafted, designed, implemented with a vision towards inclusion. Um, and that that is going to be not only exciting to be part of, but important to be to to look for. So um, again, I, I am a student of government. I've I've along the way I've captured all these different tools because I want to better understand what how government works. But at the end of the day, Nestor, as you know, government is us. If we have a, a population that's disinterested, that is pushing aside government, that is not understanding how we work, we are only as good as the people who are involved. So I make a plea all the time for people to be part of government and, and to be much more um, engaged in a constructive manner. Um, of course, we're not perfect, but the constructive manner is to have a dialogue, to have a healthy debate and to be able to be architects of the future. 
Yeah, you mentioned you mentioned these um, these geographical inequalities across the nation, um, and uh, and it is interesting because here at the USPTO we have been uh, looking at how how the nation interacts with the patent and trademark system, and 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 you begin to clearly detect that there are some areas of the nation that are not engaging with 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 us, uh, and you know as customers and. And we're trying to figure out, you know, how do we reach those areas? How do we get the, um, the you know, the people in those areas to to engage in protecting their intellectual property? Because you know that there is innovation going on in, everywhere across the nation, uh, but some people are taking advantage of it uh, and protecting uh, our, you know, protecting their intellectual property and taking advantage of our of our services, and and some some other communities are not. Uh, and we got to take a more proactive. Uh, you know, approach in in trying to reach those areas so that everybody begins to uh, uh, to come up. Yeah, you mentioned you know in every job I've had, I've been so blessed that I've had the opportunity to travel our country. I've traveled everywhere from Ottumwa, Iowa, Wenatchee, Washington, you know, Gary, Indiana, San Juan, Puerto Rico, and to be able to look at the the breadth of our of our country and the innovation that's happening, you know, when you go to Ottumwa, Iowa, you, there are people who are doing some incredible things when it comes to uh, agricultural technology and agricultural innovation. Um, when you look at, you know, so many different places have not only a very unique perspective because of their the landscape that they're in. But how do we access um, USPTO services? How do we access EDA services? So a lot of a lot of my time in the last six weeks has been outreach because, as I mentioned, we have three billion dollars, three billion dollars, something unheard of for EDA. And I want to make sure that it's if it if it's in Camuy, Puerto Rico, or whether it's you know in some other other place across our country that they're understanding these dollars are to really help your community. So a lot of what we do in terms of the EDA, but I'm sure that USPTO as well is the outreach, engaging communities that have traditionally not been part of our, uh, you know, cast of known uh, partners to bring them along. And yes, it'll take some time because sometimes the capacity uh, at the ground level is not there. But we have to invest and we have to pay attention to making sure that um, our services are also distributed in a very equitable manner. Yeah, a big, a, a big part of our outreach is, is, is conducted by, by our regional offices and we got several across, across the nation. Um, another arm of that outreach sort of a concept is, is the, the patent and trademark resource centers that we have. Uh, and these are located in different libraries across across the country, uh, a bunch of which are academic, other are public libraries, and so on. But it's you know it's our way of reaching into the community and having people there that are able to speak patents and trademarks with 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 folks that are interested in in uh, in those uh, in those concepts. Uh, that program, I thought you know as I read into into EDA's programs. Uh, I, I thought that program was sort of very similar to your university centers program uh, and where you are out there in different universities trying to leverage the, uh, you know, the, the, the resources of a university to spur economic development in, in those areas. I thought that it would be interesting to explore how can the USPTO, you know, partner with EDA to try to get these two centers to to collaborate and you know and, and use our resources to to expand economic development across communities. No, and that's a great point. You know, as I mentioned, I'm not new to commerce. I was at here at Commerce for almost eight years. So a lot of what I um, have done in, in previous positions and now at EDA is to partner with our sister agencies. And you're absolutely right. Um, USPTO, how do we partner? How do we leverage EDA's six regional offices? our university center um, collaboration, as well as many other uh, programs that we have to make sure that folks are getting the right um, information, the right um, uh, access to technical assistance. Similarly with NIST, Na National Institute of Standards and Technology, right? They're doing a lot of uh, technology and innovation uh, on so many levels. And I'll tell you something also, Nestor, if I may, you know, we need to pay attention to what's coming down the pike with regards to reconciliation. Right now, the reconciliation, people are hearing about it. 
but there is some really transformative efforts that are coming that are, that are included in there. And for EDA, there's something called tech hubs, which can range any, anywhere between eight to ten billion dollars. So EDA is going to be um, entering into this 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 arena of creating technology and innovation hubs across the country. How are we going to pair those technology and innovation hubs with the work that USPTO is doing? We're not there yet, right? Uh, it's still up in Congress, but thinking ahead, as you well pointed out, it's it's really figuring out synergies because this type of investment is not a one-off. This is a very unique moment in time and we have to really design and architect it so that we're providing uh, opportunities for folks and hopefully a, like a one-stop shop where you don't have to just go you know, chasing government uh, offices, but that we actually can think about it in a much more comprehensive and holistic way. Excellent. Uh, I, I, we got about a minute left. I, I'm, I'm just gonna close it with this, with this quick question. Uh, I think you've lived the American dream. Uh, you put yourself in a position to significantly help others achieve the American dream. Uh, what is your perspective on the state of the American dream uh, and what it looks like for millions of, of people that are still trying to reach it? Yeah, I, I want to be an optimist as I always am. Um, I think it's still, um, it's, it's, it exists, right? It exists, but it is taking much more work. Um, families are still challenged and struggling. Um, I think that again, what President Biden is is not only do, saying, but mostly doing is creating, how do we um, invest in our infrastructure, both hardcore physical infrastructure, as well as the social infrastructure. Because unless the two come together, daily life is getting very challenging. Cost of living, housing, so many different things. So I'm hopeful because if you look at the at the Build Back Better agenda, it's to make sure that the American dream and the American goal is alive and well and accessible to everyone. So I I joined, I came back to join in that, in that um fight and that agenda, because I believe that once we get that through, we're going to see the American dream truly uh, become a reality for, for every American. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule uh, uh, to, to share your experiences and insight with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. It's been fascinating. Um, Néstor, muchísimas gracias. Sería, sería algo que no pudiera vivir si no por lo menos digo unas cuantas palabras en español dado a la herencia hispana. So, muchísimas gracias por esta oportunidad. Claro, igual a ti. Sean, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Nestor. Thank you, Alejandra. We appreciate you being here today. Thank you for all of that insight and information. I, I can't tell you how wonderful it is to see your passion come through in your work. And when you talk about it, it really comes through. And I appreciate that. Thank you for being with us today.